Okay, Amy. Er okay. Colleagues, uh, thank you for being here today. As we're about to begin, please be seated. I guess you all are, except in this center section. I don't understand that. It's okay, I always sit in the back, close to the door. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Faculty Development Summit. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our special guests and award recipients, as well as Amy Blue, our keynote speaker. Dr. Samari will talk a little bit more in his introduction of Dr. Blue in a few minutes. The Faculty Development Summit is a half-day networking and learning opportunity intended for all the faculty from all our schools at the University of Kansas Medical Center. The theme for the summit this year is transforming teaching and learning. In addition to our keynote speaker at lunch today, we'll have six faculty members who will present their work and research in the TED Talk format beginning at 1.30 today in, in this room, and I hope we'll have, a good, uh, have good attendance for that. Pretty excited about uh, this innovative approach. A full schedule of the Ed Like TED Talks, that's tongue twister, with information on each presenter are available on the back table. You may have those already. Additionally, we hope that you'll join us from 4 to 5 p.m. for a poster session. Uh, we have a record number of posters, 27, surpassing last year's 24. Faculty and learners from KU Medical Center will present posters on their research and interprofessional work that is taking place at the university. We also hope the poster session will help to stimulate ideas for additional research, scholarship, and to foster some networking. Faculty Development Summit is held in conjunction with the fourth annual Interprofessional Preceptor Summit that happened this morning. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Christy Johnson, Sarah Schrader, Steve Jernigan, and Sarah Goodman for their work in putting on the summit, which is intended to provide preceptors with the tools to provide intentional interprofessional education and collaborative practice opportunities in real world practice environments. I'd also like to thank the members of our team, uh, Jenny Mehmet, Sydney Brakefield, who've been uh, working on this for quite a while. And on to the very important aspect of uh, our award presentations. I'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge individuals from KU Med Center who've received various awards this year. I'd like to first ask the recipients of the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award to come forward. And I know it's kind of confusing, so this is the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award, as opposed to other Chancellor's Awards. And as you come forward, I will talk a little bit about it. The Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award is intended to recognize and reward faculty who have demonstrated teaching ability of a clearly superlative nature. Recipients of this award are faculty who contribute to the university and its students through excellence and outstanding classroom teaching. Faculty can be nominated by a student or faculty member. Although the KU Med recipients of the 2018 Distinguished Teaching Awards were recognized at the Teaching Summit in Lawrence uh, in August, we'd like to take this opportunity to recognize them again today. So I'd like to recognize, uh, we're going to do one at a time, but I guess one group picture is my understanding. So. We can start. Oh, good. OK. I walk of shame right here. <laughs> Just in time, because you're first, Lee. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, let's see. So first, Lee Eck is Associate Professor of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Genetics and Program Director of the Internal Medicine Residency Program. Congratulations, Dr. Eck. Uh, Mark Meyer is Professor of Family Medicine and Associate Dean for Student Affairs in the School of Medicine. We added your middle initial. Okay, Charles. Christopher, yeah, wrong guess. Okay. Uh, Jill Pelser is assistant professor in the School of Nursing. Congratulations. Catherine Satterwhite. Catherine Satterwhite is Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Public Health in the School of Medicine. I guess I should join in. Maybe not one long line, maybe kind of stagger yourself just a little bit. Stagger. There's no alcohol here. That's perfect. 
so this is the correct thing. That's great. All right, I'm going to take a couple. Here we go. Let's do one more. I'd like to take a few moments to give a special acknowledgement to Dr. Thomas Yankee, received this award posthumously this year, again in Lawrence for the uh, KU Teaching Summit. We're pleased today to have several members of Dr. Yankee's family with us today. His wife, Chris Yankee, Dr. Yankee's mother, Eileen Yankee, his brother, David Yankee, his nep nephew, Andrew Yankee, and Chris's parents, Aletta and Woody Worthen. Would you please join me in welcoming them to our campus? I'd like to ask you all to please turn your attention to the video screen for a short video honoring Dr. Yankee. very fortunate to be introduced to Tom when I was asked to be a clinical co-director for the I2 School of Medicine module a few years ago. Uh, Tom Yankee was a good colleague of mine in uh, the Department of Microbiology. I first met Dr. Tom Yankee in my first year of medical school. I was in the department with Tom for over 10 years and when I think about Tom I think about various aspects of uh, my interaction with him. One certainly as a colleague uh, he was very uh, Always very helpful, very organized, very kind, and always got projects done on time. And that was one thing, he was extremely dependable. He always got things done on time. He was teaching the immunity and inflammation module, which is notoriously the toughest module, and everybody was kind of freaking out. So I think what really drew me to Tom was that he seemed very calm and really passionate about the subject. And not only passionate, but like, really excited to teach us and make sure that we understood everything that he was teaching us. Tom not only cared about what the students learned, but he genuinely cared about the way in which they learned the material. He would pique their um, curiosities and then let them really come to the understanding that they could push themselves uh, beyond their own expectations. And that's something that is uh, an amazing attribute in an educator. He was quite innovative in, in teaching, uh, together with, with other immunology faculty in our department. Uh, he developed uh, probably kind of what the precursor is to this current curriculum. He was such a good mentor that he individually found out what everybody wanted to do and then used that to kind of drive their projects, give them opportunities. He was just awarded a Chancellor's Club Distinguished Teaching Award uh, for his dedication to his immunology teaching. He was the the main one in our department who taught immunology to the medical students and did an outstanding job and was rewarded constantly by the students. As he taught the med students, I could see how passionate he was about it because no matter how busy he was, there'd always be a line of med students at his door. He'd take, make the time to talk with all of them individually and teach them all the things they needed to know. I think we only noticed uh, after he was gone how many collaborations he actually had struck up uh, in, in the, the community here from anywhere uh, within K Medical Center all the way to Children's Mercy and beyond. And he collaborated with these people and uh, interacted with them to try to develop these T cells to the point where they could um, fight cancer cells and he had some very promising projects going on. These projects to some extent are still being carried on today. So he was really kind of the the consummate collaborator scientifically with, with a lot of people. He never made a big fuss about it. Um, he was quite quiet and, and, and reserved. So I will always remember Tom as a uh, as kind, warm-hearted, um, very positive attitude, always upbeat. I really hope that um, I could be as great as a mentor as he was. I will be forever grateful for the time I got to spend with Tom. I think of him often when I give lectures, and I hope that somewhere in teacher heaven, he's just proud of me.
Uh, Jenny Mehmet's going to present certificates to uh, members of the family, to Chris and Eileen. Thanks, Jenny. So there were two Chancellor's Club teaching professorships this year. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Blanco is out of the country and cannot be here today. Let me tell you a little bit about the Chancellor's Club teaching professorship. Recognized as sustained excellence in teaching, awarded only to persons who've demonstrated outstanding teaching competence over an extended period of years. Recipients hold these chairs for as long as they remain active as teachers and full-time faculty members at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Although the KU Med Center recipients, I just said, uh, recognize that the Chancellor's Club dinner on the Lawrence campus, we'd like to take this opportunity to recognize them on this campus. In 2018, we had two faculty members, uh, but Joe's going to represent both Dr. Blanco and himself today. Um, let me tell you just a drop about Dr. Blanco. He's Professor and Kathleen M. Osborne Chair of the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology. And then Dr. Fontes, professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And so I'm supposed to shake your hand. The Glendon G. Cox. The Glendon G. Cox Leadership Award honors members of our academic medical community as leaders and recognizes contributions made in an extraordinary fashion and at a consistently high level over a span of many years. The award is faculty initiated, recognizes our colleagues who've shown sustained leadership and an excellence in their service to KU Med Center. For the purpose of this award, leadership and excellence can be in any area of academic life. It is with these criteria in mind that we recognize the 2018 recipients of the Glendon G. Cox Leadership Award, Dr. Cindy Teal, Professor in School of Nursing, and Dr. Belinda Vale, Professor and Chair of the Department of Family Medicine, School of Medicine. So I, I also ask the namesake and the first recipient of this award to step forward and I need to make an, a very important uh, statement. Uh, this is an award that would not be possible without the generosity of Voya and Presswood Financial Group. Wendy and Mark Presswood are here today. And this is one of several awards that they support, and I think they make them extra special. It's also uh, Wendy's 21st birthday today, so happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Adam. I always have something up in these. I saw Diane, Diane Durham smiling. We reunited Glenn Bob. Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Inside joke. Uh, okay. It's my pleasure to introduce my boss, uh, Dr. Rob Samari, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of the School of Medicine, Dr. Samari. Thank you, Bob. 
you. Uh, oh, second. We're gonna, we're gonna back the truck up here for just a moment. As a client tradition, there's always something I can screw up. So, um, in addition to the uh, teaching awards that are given in, in Lawrence for the summit and at the Chancellor's Club dinner, there is the Chancellor's Club Research Award, and that this year was given to Dr. Andy Godwin, who just got off an airplane and came directly here to uh, get his certificate and, and lunch. <laughs> Andy Godwin. Congratulations, Andy. Congratulations. <laughs> you said stagger, so I didn't say the introduction. You want more? The man who now needs no introduction, Dr. Samari. So it's really a, an honor today to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Amy Blue. Uh, Dr. Blue uh, shared with me that she's really coming full circle as her father grew up on a mushroom farm in Raytown. I'm betting it's no longer there. I'm just, I'm just guessing that uh, it's, it's no longer there. Uh, Dr. Blue is the Associate Vice President for Interprofessional Education, University of Florida Health, and the Associate Dean for Educational Affairs and Clinical Professor in the College of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Florida. She earned her doctorate in anthropology from Case Western Reserve University and completed a, a, a National Institute of Mental Health postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine, Department of Behavioral Science. Dr. Blue's been engaged in health professions education for over 20 years, having implemented and directed several educational programs involving students from multiple health professions, such as medical, dental, biomedical science, pharmacy, nursing, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and public health. In 2007, she became the founding director of the Interprofessional Education Program at the Medical University of South Carolina, where she was named Assistant Provost for Education. She served in that role until she assumed her current position at the University of Florida in 2013. She's published over 100 peer review articles in the medical and health professions education literature, is an associate editor of the Journal of Interprofessional Care, and associate editor for the Journal of Interprofessional Education and Practice. Dr. Blue served as a member of the Interprofessional Education Collaborative Expert Panel that wrote the core competencies for Interprofessional Collaborative Practice Report in 2011 and completed a study funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation examining, examining assessment and evaluative processes in interprofessional education. In 2018, she received the AAMC Southern Group on Educational Affairs Career Educator Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Blue to the podium. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, so if any of you are long term Kansas City or Raytown uh, natives, it was, yeah, my, my father grew up on a farm here and my uncle had the mushroom farm. I should have asked a cousin yesterday when did they closed the farm, and yes, I think uh, they got a lot of money, and uh, that, that area is now probably has houses and things on it. So I was very excited when I got the invitation several months ago to come and speak with you all, one, because it is giving me a chance to see family, but two, I also have some wonderful colleagues, I see some of them back there, here that I've worked with at other institutions, and I've actually been back and forth here a couple times as we chat about medical education I'm with Julia Bonamini and Sarah Schrader and Steve around interprofessional education. So again, thanks for the invitation. And as what happens when you get these things and you, you say yes and then the reality hits of like, oh now, what, what am I going to say? Uh, and this then hit me because I was like, well, most of the time when I come and you know, give a talk at a place, they're just starting out with IPE. And I think I'm kind of there to give them the rah, rah, you can do it, it's hard, but you can do it. And I realized, well, I'm coming to a place that has been doing this for a long time, that actually I admire a lot of the work that you're doing. Um, you're publishing, I think, Stevie just had something come out, I'm probably forgetting other colleagues. 
the Journal of Interprofessional Care, some of the great work Sarah's done around with her national, internationally known program. Train the trainer, you're participating in some of that today. So again, my challenge was, well, what new do I have to tell these folks, okay? So I came up with some perhaps modest goals or learning objectives for this session. And hopefully, again, we'll be discussing the benefits of interprofessional teamwork. I am going to spend a little bit of time around what I think or have been thinking more and more about are really fundamental foundations for effective teamwork. And if nothing else, because many of you are here during this summit uh, to reinforce, and the whole thing is really to reinforce and reaffirm the great work that you're doing and have you leave, again, advocating for the need and to continue your own engagement in interprofessional collaborative care. So those are my goals. Is that okay? Okay. Let's see if I can get this going. So, because I never quite know how many in the room are thinking about IPE on a daily basis, I do like to start with sort of some common definitions for those of us who aren't thinking about it on a daily basis. And so this is the one that really is commonly used, uh, and it's pretty simple. It occurs when two or more professions learn about, from, and with each other to improve collaboration and the quality of care. And I've actually used this, we've used it back at, at MUSC, I don't know if, if Sarah remembers that, as a way to even sort of judge if an elective, if an activity really was going to be truly interprofessional in scope. And I, I know the other day I was reviewing an article for a journal and I was kind of like, I'm not, I'm not really sure they're quite getting what IPE is all about. So again, this is our commonly used definition and I, I know many of you are familiar with it. The whole purpose, again, is to have our graduates and or our practitioners engage in interprofessional collaborative practice. That is, as you can see here from the definition, when we basically have health workers from all different professional backgrounds working together, working together to deliver the highest quality of care. And you may or may not have noticed, so I'll point it out with both of these definitions, that they are from the World Health Organization. And I point this out, particularly for those who are new in the field, to let them know that this whole thing of interprofessional education and collaborative practice is not some US phenomenon or North American phenomenon, because a lot has been going on in Canada, but it is truly global in scope. This is around the world. And therefore, I think it's important that we're using these definitions from the World Health Organization. So you're probably familiar within, we'll go back to the US healthcare context specifically, that we are having a shift in paradigms, a shift in emphasis from the practitioner as an individual who is focused on his or her own clinical skills, on his or her kind of making their own decision. Think of it as somewhat as the autonomous individual, but you know, connecting is needed with others, um, thinking about their own self-improvement, to really going to that team, team member, teamwork mindset where particularly in education, our responsibility now is not only for our students to acquire the clinical knowledge and skills for their profession, but also for them to have some familiarity, some ability to work as effective team members, those process skills. And I think that's where it's so hard for us as educators, even as practitioners, kind of get our heads around what are those, how do we do that, et cetera. But we're recognizing that both sets of these skills are as equally important, that team performance is important, and that within the teamwork, there is the mutual support. You're looking not only at your own self-improvement, but you want to be thinking about how a team can improve and team efficiency. So we have that paradigm shift going on. Now, I won't quiz you. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the IPEC competencies, and, and thanks for the introduction. For, for better or worse, I was on the original panel representing the AAMC when these came out in May 2011. And well, at that time, we had this definition of interprofessional education, you know, learners learning about from and with each other. I, I have colleagues say, but still, what does that, what does that mean? What, what does that look like? What does someone do? And so, 
as you do with these kinds of reports, you get a group of people together, and I'm sure if we gave you the same task, you'd probably come up with a similar result. We looked at what else was out there in other organizations. Our friends to the north and Canada had done some great work, and we came up with four broad competency domains, and then within them several nine to 12 other competency domains. Please do not quiz me on what those are. The four domains are value and ethics for interprofessional practice, roles and responsibility, interprofessional communication, and fourth one is teams and teamwork. Got to throw that in there somewhere. What some of you may not be aware of is that in 2016, the IPEC, the IPEC board decided to update the competencies. And I'll confess, I was a little nervous before I read it, because I was like, oh no, if they switch out of those four broad domains, this is going to be really hard for me to learn something new. Fortunately, they didn't. So we still have those four broad domains that kind of went to competency statements. Please don't ask me to recite that verbatim. But what they did in the report was bring out what was, I would argue, was still there anyway originally, but more of the emphasis around public health, population health, preventive medicine, preventive health, community health, and some other tweaks with that. And so that, in my mind, is sort of what, what happened with the update. The four domains remain. The other important thing within the update is that IPEC itself, itself has expanded from the original, I think it was six professions that were there, or six organizations that were there, to many, many others. It never intended to be an exclusive group and now has really become the inclusive group and continuing to have other health professions join it uh, so that we can all work together to help transform healthcare in this country. So I think after that first IPEC report came out, then we just had this tremendous explosion in what I'll say right now is still really a very new field. Um, those of you who probably read a lot more than I have can sit there and say like, oh, but we were doing things like this back in the 70s and, and the 80s, that's true. But I think the renewed uh, emphasis or the new extended emphasis on interprofessional education really has been in the last 10 or so years and since the IPEC report came out, particularly for those of us in the United States. And lots of things have been happening. And again, you all have been major contributors to those things that are happening. What some of you are very familiar with and probably um, know about are inter interprofessional education or interprofessional collaborative experiences to some extent are pretty much now required in all of the health professions accreditation standards. And if there's one up there that shouldn't, that should be listed and isn't, please forgive me. Um, but they pretty much are listed. What's interesting is that the language may vary a little bit and some of them are now asking for some specifics around assessment. I know when I was talking with Christy Johnson and Jenny, I think a week or so, Christy was saying, and, and some of you may know from your work with the National Center, that the accreditors are going to try to come up with some more standardization for the various accrediting bodies, which I think I'll find helpful in my role working with a variety of different schools and sort of recognizing, okay, well, public health is asking for this definition of assessment and other people really aren't even asking for assessment, they're just asking for something to happen and hopefully begin to clarify things for us in the field. But as we all know, once something is in an accreditation standard, what do you have to do? You gotta do it, right? You gotta start doing it in some fashion. Um, for those of you more in the medical world, I think um, with the work with the entrustable professional activities, there's the one around collaborating as a member of an interprofessional team. And then I think late, I, I learned about this late summer, uh, so it's a couple months old, the um, Clinical Learning Environment Review, the national findings, this is from the um, ACG related to graduate medical education. Its report came out, and when you read it, you'll find that there are a lot of references to teamwork, interprofessional collaboration, several findings saying that this is an area that could be improved within the clinical learning environment, should be improved within the clinical learning environment, not only within the context of patient care, but they reference in terms of quality improvement, and this all leads back to the patient safety movement. So again, this is in graduate medical education as well. And then a couple years ago, I, I received this in the mail, I'm not, or see how well this projects. It's provider competencies 
for the prevention and management of obesity. And I was struck because there are 4.0 that says competencies for interprofessional obesity care. And they actually have several of them listed. And I thought, wow, this is getting into a specific kind of clinical focus. And they've got a competency they're calling for the providers to be providing interprofessional care. Again, part of this massive explosion of what's going on with the field and within healthcare. So oftentimes, if you haven't, people then begin to say like, well, what's the evidence? We're doing this. Amy, you said all this activity is going on. We have to do it in accreditation. All these people want us to do it. Does it make any difference? And a few weeks ago when I started working on this, I'm not the greatest um, medline searcher, so I just sort of clunkily put in to the search engine interprofessional care outcomes, and there are about 2,700 articles that came up. And then interprofessional education outcomes, and a little over 2,000 article came up. And I'm like, OK, there's a lot being done here. And again, you folks are part of, part of this uh, body of literature that's happening. And for a fair, relatively new field, I think, wow, that's a lot that's going on. But again, what do we know about the evidence? So I will take us back a couple years to the fall of 2014. Some of you may have read this article. It's from our colleagues at the National Center. There is a National Center for Interprofessional Education and Practice. Again, I know many of you are doing work with them. This article came out of the Journal of Interprofessional Care, and it's a scoping review of interprofessional collaborative practice and education using the lens of the triple aim. The National Center really wants us in IPE and practice to focus on the triple aim, you know, improving population health, reducing health care costs, and improving the quality of care delivered. And I've highlighted here, you've already read the bottom line. No demonstrated impact of IPE or collaborative practice on these areas. And now I will share with you, I had, sincerely, a crisis of faith when I read that. It was a late September afternoon. I'm in Gainesville, it's central North Florida. We still often get thunder afternoon thunderstorms. And the sky had darkened. It was about to rain. We were about a week before we launch our year-long, at that point, probably the 17th year of our year-long interprofessional activity that engages about 800 students. And I read this article, and I thought to myself, why are I doing this? I have colleagues who believe in this. They've done a review. It's gone through the peer review literature. They know what they're doing. And this is their conclusion. Why am I doing this? I, again, I'll, I'll confess, a crisis of faith. And then I thought, and I remembered Helen Haskell. Helen Haskell is the mother of Lewis Blackman that you see pictured here. And back in my MUSC days, we had an interprofessional day. And for several years, we asked Helen to come and share with our first year health profession students about her experience and her tragic loss of her teenage son from care that was not interprofessionally collaborative at the Medical University of South Carolina. Sorry, I still choke up about it. It was hard. And I thanked her for the years. I, she may still be coming, I don't know, when she came to share that story. That's how you get their attention. When I moved to the University of Florida, I found out that our quality and safety office, named the Sebastian Ferrero Office Quality Safety, was named because a young toddler had died due to the lack of interprofessional teamwork at the institution. And the institution recognized that with the quality, by naming the office, and the parents have done tremendous charitable work. Some of you have met, maybe have read Josie's story a mother who wrote about the loss of her toddler at an institution, again, due to the lack of interprofessional teamwork. And then if any of you have gone through Team Steps training or a variant of Team Steps training, often the Sue Sheridan video is shown. And Sue lost a husband, but also had a child who um, had cerebral palsy as a result of several medical errors. 
So on that afternoon, when momentarily I had a crisis of faith, I then remembered that I'm in this business to prevent these kinds of things from continuing to happen. So we're still doing our first year activity, putting families first, and I'm still in this game coming out here and affirming the great work that you all are doing because there are individuals behind each of these stories when we read about medical errors and our patients who are dying because of the lack of quality care. So some other evidence, okay, got us a little, little, little down there. So what's some other evidence? Um, this was the most recent Cochrane review I could find. So just be polite if you're gonna um, point out to me that there's something even more recent out there. It came out in 2017. Again, Cochrane reviews are sort of the gold standard in terms of the effectiveness of whatever you're looking at. So this was interprofessional collaboration to improve professional practice and healthcare outcomes. And I bolded so it's easier for you. Um, there's really low to very low. There's not a sufficient evidence to draw conclusions on the effects of IPC interventions. But I don't have that crisis of faith anymore because I'm a believer and I think things are improving. We've got more going out there in the literature. And because there'd been a couple Cochrane reviews earlier, they're now in the position to say that there is encourage, that things are encouraging, that there actually is um, greater research on the number of interventions to improve IPC, that this hasn't, has increased. And actually the Institute of Medicine, I want to say it was 2015, came out with a report for those of us in the field to say, yes, we need to be doing this research. We know good stuff is going on out there. We need to make sure the research is more rigorous. And it's a complex field. We have patients who are being cared for in a variety of kinds of settings through a variety of kind of interprofessional models. People use terms differently. It is complex. And if you look at the team teamwork training literature, they will tell you, yes, it does make a difference. So do not lose faith. And then people have begun to discuss, well, are there perhaps some additional benefits, things that go beyond simply the triple aim? Some are now talking about a quadruple aim, and that would be with respect to provider well-being. Or the other way of thinking about it is, can we avoid clinician burnout? And in fact, there is some research, some of the literature is beginning to say that yes, there are some benefits of having our providers work in effective interprofessional teams. This report, it came out from the National Academy of Science, I want to say maybe within two months, you can read the full thing, implementing optimal team-based care to reduce clinician burnout. And some of the things that they have found, and they mentioned in this, is ways to, that this may help mitigate burnout is one is when there are clear roles, when everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing on the team. Another is having fully staffed teams, and I'm sure some of you can appreciate that because maybe you haven't always worked on a fully staffed team or just you know you appreciate when you have everybody there. One can definitely think having a strong team climate uh, very much helps for provider well-being. Clearly, when there's effective communication, when people are clear and timely with what they want to be saying, that it's going to be helpful. The role of participatory decision-making on a team helps, again, with this well-being. And it was the last point that caught me that I hadn't thought about, but that in an effective team, the reiteration of accomplishments, sort of the focus on positive things that are going on with the team, can also be very helpful for clinician well-being. Uh, too often, sort of people I think have recognized, too often we focus on the negative, and if we just kind of step back and as a team applaud the good things that are going on, it really is an important morale boost. And so yes, one of the other benefits that we're learning about that is attributable to effective interprofessional teamwork, again, is improvement in clinician well-being. And now I'm gonna throw out to you that perhaps we could also gain some benefits if we begin to think about interprofessional education is also with the benefits that they're learning from the world and the work of diversity and inclusion. I know you're probably sitting there going like, okay, Amy, what does diversity and inclusion have to do with interprofessional teamwork? And I think in the introduction, you said that my doctorate is in anthropology. And I, I don't want to go completely into the each profession is its own tribe, uh, but I will in a minute. 
But first of all, what they're learning in the world of diversity and inclusion is that when you have diverse teams, you actually are smarter. There's a fantastic article, I'd almost say like if there's nothing else you get from my time with you today, go and look up, I've got the references, the one from Scientific America, How Diversity Makes Us Smarter. It's a terrific article. And the business world is clearly looking at how diverse teams helps the bottom line and produces more innovation. But again, you're going like, why does this have to do with interprofessional teamwork? And I've said, are we not perhaps tribes or being less tribal? I argue that our own health professions have um, unique identities. Traditionally, each of the professions is socialized separately. And with that arises a variety of cultural assumptions about the profession and about other professions, okay? With that arises myths and stereotypes. We all know that pharmacists count by five. We all know that dentists are really in there to make people have pain. People in health administration, they're really there just to count beans and make everybody's life miserable. Okay, are you with me? PTs are actually personal trainers and they're awesome personal trainers and who knows what an occupational therapist does, okay? So I'm, I'm making a point around myths and stereotypes, but, but we have them. Um, by the way, every profession works the hardest, every profession has the most rigorous curriculum, okay? And I actually am serious about that because I have the pleasure and several of you do too. Work across, this, working with students and providers across these professions, they're all equally bright and talented. It is just that there's been an aspect of healthcare that is aligned most with their temperament and their talents that has had them decide to go down the path of being the physician or the dentist or the pharmacist or whatever. I also have on here, there are those issues of power, hierarchy and distrust and I'll come back to that. So there's a wonderful article, I don't think we've talked about it enough within interprofessional education. It's called Worldviews and Collisions in Collision. It came out in 2006 from I think it's sociologists and um, some perhaps organizational psychologists. And their contention was they looked at three health professions, physicians, nurses, and health administration, and took the concept of worldview and very nicely described, the article's a little long, but nicely described the unique features of each of these and yet recognizing they're all working in the same environment. So I pulled out some of the things from a table they've got in the article just to kind of illustrate my point a little bit more about each of these professions as a unique, unique identity and therefore this is a variant on diversity. So in terms of a key identifying principle for the profession for medicine, it's around diagnosis and clinical care delivery. Probably that's what we're there for. Nursing, patient care and advocacy. Health administration, they're looking at the organization and its financial health, right? What I thought was interesting was that sort of the influential interest in terms of career choice. I know my own son has just recently done one of those career, you know, what what your temperament or talents or things are, and then it comes out with what you're best at. Um, his didn't come out with any of these, so we'll see what happens with him. But for physicians, investigative. That exploration and, and, and learning, investigative. Nursing, more of a social. And health administration, it's enterprising, entrepreneurial. These authors and said the basis for reward, again, this differs. Now, some of this may be changing given the different financing within the, our U.S. healthcare system, but for physicians, it's procedure and volume. How many, how many procedures, how many patients are you seeing? Nurses, it's time. It's time on a shift. For health administrators, their basis for reward, are we meeting our organizational goals? And even when you look at sort of the, the non-tangible, as they said, the material or the social basis for reward, typically, and again, this is all typical, for physicians, it's gonna be clinical competence. That's what they, you know, they're striving for and wanna be known for. It's not that nurses don't wanna be known for that, but it's gonna be through their service to their patients and coworkers. And then those within health administration, they're looking for that position of influence and prestige. So I use this, again, if you have the chance, look at the article, very fascinating. They go into even more details. But it speaks to me, again, how each of our professions are unique and that we need to think about more diversity and inclusion. 
So those of you, those of the, who've been looking at this and trying to figure out why diverse teams create more innovative solutions or improve the bottom line, and in a nutshell, it's because they probably have to work harder. They bring more information and they bring more facts to what they're going to do because they, they know not everybody's going to know the same thing that they know. So terrific TED Talk. Again, I have it referenced here, but t talking about, again, innovation, I talk about intersectionality, but their contention is you innovate through combining unrelated concepts. Now, again, you may be sitting there saying like, well, in patient care, we're all kind of thinking the same thing, and I'll say yes, but there might be sometimes either an equality improvement, and hopefully I'll remember an example to show you some other ways, where having people from truly different perspectives are gonna have you come up with a very different way to improve a patient's care, or to improve a healthcare system issue, or to improve a social issue that's impacting the health of a community. But back to members with diverse teams. Again, knowing not everybody's the same, they tend to anticipate alternative views and prepare for that better. The group's more likely to re-examine facts and just to process information more carefully. My shorthand is that they avoid group think. And the study I should have done, and I welcome you all to do it, um, we were using a standardized patient scenario for a year. And a couple of times we had to have just a uni professional team of medical students interact with the standardized patient. And the goal was, you know, get the information, come together as a team, look at the electronic health record, come up with a diagnosis and plan, and then, you know, share it with the patient. But we also at times had interprofessional teams where, again, it was primarily medical students, but occasionally there was a pharmacy student or a physician assistant student. Both groups did okay. We weren't doing this as a real formal assessment, but I noticed a difference in the quality. The medical students jumped in, quick, quick, got the information, sped it back out to the patient, and were generally on target. But the teams that had just a different profession in them, they took a little bit longer. It's exactly, I realize now, I, I, I read this after we had done this, that they processed the information more clearly, and they often had additional suggestions for the patient. So that had me begin to think about, huh, what's going on with interprofessional education and the role of diversity and inclusion when you've got a team that's really working well together? And then I'd also started reflecting on work I was doing at the time with a nurse managed clinic uh, in a rural, outside of Gainesville, rural area. And with that team, it was completely inclusive in terms of including the receptionist, Phyllis, Anna was the receptionist, Phyllis was the billing person, we had the practice manager, Joan, we had Thomas, the IT guy, we had everybody in the clinic. It was not simply providers who we did team training with and then every two weeks that group got together and talked about the specific panel of patients that they were working with. This was a HRSA funded project. And very quickly it became apparent that the non-healthcare providers had very important information about these patients to share that influenced kind of the decisions we were making and the recommendations we were making for the, for the patients. And other receptionists could say who was having difficulty in terms of transportation coming and who was having to bring their grandkids to the visits. And because they were having grandkids at the house who might be a little unruly, Maybe it was going to be hard for them to take some of these recommendations. Joan, the practice manager, lived in the community and, again, knew a lot of the family's history, which grandparents, again, were taking care of which set of kids, maybe because an elder uh, child was in jail or had had a stroke. They knew the family dynamics and, therefore, why it might be difficult. Someone was having challenges keeping up with a medication regime or um, advice to change diet, et cetera. And then I mentioned Thomas, the IT guy, right? I singled Thomas out because everybody else was female. And sometimes with the male patients, Thomas would chime in and say, yeah, we need to think of another way to get his attention because if he doesn't start taking his medication on a regular basis, this is not going to be really helpful for him as a man. Thomas even said, I'll go talk to some of these individuals. And then there was the meeting. It was about this time of year. We were again talking about a family. Phyllis chimed in. Phyllis is the billing person. You'd be amazed, apparently, how many questions ask your billing person. I wasn't quite clear what Dr. So-and-so said. Okay? So they get, again, a lot of interesting patient interaction. 
But Phyllis knew this particular family, it was a grandfather, that they were really struggling very, very much financially. It, the holidays were upcoming. The family was worried about what they were going to give for their grandkids. And we in the clinics were like, wow, you know what, why don't we just start a little patient fund and, and, and get, help them out a little bit. We could go and you know buy necessities like toilet paper, buy some food so that it would relieve them a little bit during this very stressful time. That was an idea that came out of a truly diverse team in terms of helping out patients and helping their, their well-being. They've continued, we started the patient fund, they've continued to do that. That project has ended. They've continued to have those team meetings with everybody who works in the clinic because they've realized all of those perspectives are needed in order to provide, to provide the best quality of care for their patients. So, as they say in the diversity and inclusion world, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to the dance. And again, I think a lot of times within interprofessional education, we're more an in interprofessional practice. We're more and more aware that we need to have everybody around, around the conference table or around the bedside, but you've got to create that environment where everybody feels like they can speak up. Or even Phil is the billing person who I know is an introvert finally speaks up and say, hey, we need to do something for this family. But I think we've got some elephants in the room related to our work in interprofessional education and practice. And the first elephant does relate back to power and hierarchy. It's here in our US healthcare system, right? Probably in others as well. We could talk about the reasons why it's here, but it is here. And I think Team Steps does a great job in terms of providing a common language, common framework, a shared mental model, so to kind of try to flatten some of that. But we need to recognize power and hierarchy is, is here. Um, just if it hasn't been talked a whole lot or studied a whole lot in the literature from what I can tell. I think Lorelei Lingard and some colleagues back in 2012, they published an article where again, one of their conclusions was members recognized the hierarchy on the team, but the physicians did not. Some of you may have heard that sort of saying about how a physician will say, oh yeah, I know my team, we work well together, everybody's kind of doing what I say, and the team members will say, um, no, we don't really feel like we're a member of a team because we're never asked what our thoughts are. So I felt this study was another way of getting at that. Um, some other colleagues um, wrote about how educators are uh, even reluctant to address this. And I, if you're going to ask me, you know, when we hopefully, we probably should have some time for question and answer. If I've got a real clear answer on this, I'm going to be honest and say I don't. But I think if we begin to talk about it and learn about it from more, more from each other, we'll be able to address it better. And then uh, another article came out just, um, I want to say, within the last month or so um, in the Journal of Interprofessional Care, where they really were looking at, <clears throat> in a qualitative manner, uh, related to education about uh, this issue of hierarchy. And some of the findings they found was, again, the, the idea of the physician as the quarterback. And we have to recognize, a lot of times financially and legally, there are those, that, that is a tension there. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but also, there can then feel, for some team members, as though they're marginalized. That can be a process that occurs. And just going back to what I'm saying is we have these issues of hierarchy and power that are still unresolved. Um, I've worked with some folks doing a, a qualitative study with a small, different, different interprofessional team at UF. This was a team in internal medicine working with patients who were being trans transitioned from the hospital into home to try to avoid that 30-day readmission process. And the team was interested. They, they were having a good time. It actually goes back to the clinician well-being. They found that being on the team really helped them a lot in terms of feeling more energized about their work and feeling more supportive. But when we did the interviews, it was interesting. This issue of hierarchy still kind of came up, and I thought this quote was very interesting. And that uh, it was a physician said, I think we have to fight against us, physicians, being the leader of the team. People sometimes look to you always to be the leader. It was essentially saying, I, I recognize that, but at times I don't want to always have to be that. 
And one of the other team members also indicated that I feel like I should speak up more, but I don't know because I'm not the physician. This was a team, when I was going through the transcripts and thinking about it, I realized only one or two of them have had any team training. They haven't had team training as a team, and we need to explore that with them, and we, we still need to explore that with them. Because again, I think perhaps within team training, these issues can kind of be discussed, and people can be feel more comfortable about shifting those supposed or non-supposed issues or, or uh, roles around power and hierarchy. But again, thinking from a diversity and inclusion perspective, this is something we need to be thinking about. And then there's bullying. I don't know, do we have any, I know we've got a couple nurses in the audience, some nurses around, okay. Um, this was one thing I learned when I got into interprofessional education. Uh, nursing has recognized nurses are not always nice to each other. I believe the saying is nurses eat their young. And yeah, they're all nodding their head. Um, the first time I can remember, I was back at MUSC in a, in a conference room. Sarah, I don't know if you were there or not. Were you there? Anyway, yeah. And, and some people around the table were like, what are they talking about? And our nursing colleagues both said, you know, sometimes we're not nice to each other. Sometimes we withhold information, variety of things, kind of bullying. And nursing has, for several years, in the literature, studied this, talked about it, um, otherwise known as horizontal or lateral violence. Again, back at MUSC, as the nursing colleagues did a, an enterprise-wide survey, because, come on, we know it's not just nurses, okay? Uh, and the results did show that it was across professions. What I found really interesting from that survey, and I, I haven't seen that they've published it, I don't know if you've seen that they published it, was that it was horizontal and then the, the vertical thing, not only from the you know, person who's superior to the person you know, in the inferior role, but apparently the opposite direction as well. Now, come on. It, you can't be an effective team member if you've got some hidden or not so hidden agendas and you're bullying each other. And as I already said, it's not just within nursing. If you read that most recent clinical learning environment report, residents were talking about mistreatment there as well. And I know on the AAMC survey, I don't know the latest sort of national statistics, but it's asked. But again, we can't be effective team members if we're not nice to each other. We need to be nice to each other. And I, I recently discovered um, one of the co-authors on this particular paper and on this line of research is actually in the business school at the University of Florida, as we've had some people begin to really study the effect of rudeness on team performance. This particular study was based in a NICU con conducted in um, Israel, and you can see I put it up here what the bottom line was. Rudeness had adverse consequences on the diagnostic and procedural performance of these members. Another article that they had written about was simply observing, being an onlooker, on, onlooker, seeing someone being the subject of rudeness also diminished team performance and creativity. So this is my reminder to everybody, okay? Be nice. Because when you're not nice, it really does matter. Which has me then be, have, remind us about psychological safety. And I realize these are all intertwined, okay? They're not nicely separated out as one might want to do them. They all work together. And again, Team Steps does recognize um, psychological safety. Part of me would say, like, we need to talk about this even more, uh, even more so when we're working with our practitioners in training and with our um, students. And what it basically is, is the notion that a psychologically safe environment is one in which you feel like you can Take some risky behaviors. You can speak up. Or actually ask for help. Say, I don't know. I'm not quite sure how to do this. And if any of you have ever worked in an environment that is not psychologically safe, I think you will resonate with what that feels like. I don't know if anybody's had the displeasure of being in an environment where you're like, I'm not going to say that on the committee because I know I'm going to get shot down and I'm just not in the mood today to risk my neck with a suggestion or say like, no, I don't think you're right. And, and I've done that. I, I, I do work in one or two environments where it's like, ah, oh, and it's uncomfortable because I know we could be doing better. 
So our colleagues looking at psychological safety, this is what they remind us in terms of promoting these safe environments. And again, this is exactly what you're trying to do if you are working with a diverse group of people, right? You want everybody to feel comfortable in terms of the providing input, saying, hey, I'm not sure that is the direction we want to go, or I'm not clear why that is the direction we want to go. First of all, you have to recognize everyone has something to contribute. Going back to our interprofessional team at that nurse-led clinic, we recognized the receptionist, the practice manager, everybody, the pharmacist, don't want, you know, they all had something equally important to contribute. And maybe when it wasn't a brilliant suggestion, that was okay because it was going to spark something else for us to think about. Finding the common ground. We all don't like conflict. And yet once we can begin to be comfortable, that conflict will if handled appropriately, is going to lead to something even better. I know for myself, I'm like, hey, this is okay. Let's find the common ground. And then from that, we can begin to figure out what we can build on to make an improvement. Clearly, in a psychologically safe environment, you don't do the blame game, right? Good way to turn everybody off. And I'd heard many years ago, it was actually at a double AMC meeting, someone talking about if you don't, ha if you don't understand what is going on, you don't have enough history about the situation. And I've reminded myself at times when I've had a colleague where I'm just not sure where, where are they coming from, maybe separately to kind of find out what is their thinking, what's the history back, you know, what's, what's going on back here so I can better understand what's going on. Depending upon the context, you may just want to talk about that within a group. And maybe somebody's resistance is based on an experience they've had before, and that's why they don't think you should go forward that way. Could be value to it, might not be value to it. But again, trying to figure out what's going on, particularly when you're finding resistance, and or if somebody keeps insisting on a terrific idea, maybe, maybe they do think they're going to get the Nobel Prize. And then finally, for those of us who are more in leadership positions or when we find ourselves in leadership positions, it's incredibly important to role model being comfortable with uncertainty. And, and getting feedback and being uncomfortable with fallibility. One thing I often find myself in meetings is to kind of make sure everybody has an opportunity to say something is either what are we not thinking about? Or depending on context, what am I not thinking about? But it's a way to sort of say, I'm recognizing I may not have thought of everything. To someone else, is there something out there that we need to be considering and maybe that person who's sitting there and is a little bit more of an introvert and quiet then has an opportunity to speak up and or somebody, including myself, may just think like, you know what, we completely forgot about X, Y, and Z and we add it in. But it's incredibly important for effective teamwork that we create these psychologically safe environments. So whether you're a member or a leader, all of our team members feel like they can provide the best they can to help us improve care and come up with the best solution for a patient. So when I talked with Christy uh, and Jenny a couple weeks ago, kind of about my thoughts, my general outline, it was great. This is when benefits of another perspective. Christy was like, "Well, Amy, remember we want to, you know, add on a positive note. What are all the, you know, what are the positive? What are the benefits of doing all this?" So I went back. We have a we have a publication. It's in submission. Hopefully they'll they'll take it with the with the revisions, based on that nurse managed clinic that I explained to, to you earlier. And these are some of the patient outcomes we found. We were focused on patients with diabetes, with depressive, depressive symptoms, and with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I'm not going to say we batted it out of the park, but there were improvements. Very, very complex patients. I would sit in those meetings, and I would wish for any politician in the United States to come and see how hard it was to figure out how to get medications for patients with incredibly complex diseases when the patients basically have no income. Separate conversation. Okay, so, but there were improvements in all of those patients. You know, the patients with diabetes, those with depressive symptoms, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That was from an interprofessional team working together effectively interprofessionally. But I've also talked to you a little bit how I think our interprofessional collaboration, certainly it's going to improve patient care. Certainly it can help with quality improvement. Can we also have it not think about larger systems issues at play? So at UF, we have what we call our clarion competition. 
Actually, I'm going to go back to that other slide. Um, and I don't think you do a Clarion competition here. So some of you. So in essence, um, the Clarion, it's a national competition from the University of Minnesota. And the ground rules of it are it's got to be interprofessional. You've got to have had at least two students from, um, or two professions on the team, four student team, two, pref two uh, students from different professions, okay? Ideally, they're all in the health professions. So I, I learned this model when I was back at MUSC. What's the first thing you do when you go to a new institution? You take something that worked well that, where you came from to implement it there, right? So I did that, it's an easy thing to do. Had a good turnout the first year. Our second year, we didn't have a great student turnout for wanting to participate in the competition. Um, we had um, a set, um, we had nine students sign up. Three of them knew each other um, from fraternity. Three of them, uh, it was a couple and then a friend. And then we had three students who didn't know each other. And we'll do matchmaking services. And so we come down to it and we're like, well, I could do two teams of four and have one student not participate, or we could do three teams of three, that is legal per the national competition. Um, all of these teams would have different professions on them, so I, I think we can go ahead with this competition. Because what we do at UF is whoever wins the local competition, we have a first place, second place, third place, whoever wins the local competition goes off and rep represents us for the national competition. Does that make sense? So again, it wasn't a crisis of faith. It was like, ooh, no, I think we can pull this off. So you want to guess which team won locally? I think somebody said it. The ones who didn't know each other. The ones who didn't know each other, and I already gave you their picture, so that was somewhat easy. But it was. It was the students who didn't know each other. Also, looking at them, you can see just visually, they're diverse. OK? We've got all sorts of diversity going on in here. Um, the young woman on that far side was an undergraduate public health student. The gentleman in the middle was actually working on his MBA, but he had an interest in health care. Um, and then the woman over here was a health policy management student uh, in our public health program. But I think probably, if I, the, the word's right, the secret sauce for them was that they didn't know each other. And therefore, also coming from very diverse professions, they had to work harder to come up. With the Clarion, you have to analyze a very complex case and come up with recommendations. And so with their different perspectives, again, they had to educate, teach each other, do that. So indeed, they were our championship team. And then they became the national championship team that year. So think about it as you continue with your own work and as you build other teams. Think about the diversity angle, not just in terms of gender, ethnicity, and things of that, like that, but think about how the interprofessional angle is also that variant of diversity and inclusion, and we're beginning to understand how that really promotes fantastic things. And so in summary, my parting thoughts are, for us to transform healthcare through better teamwork, we do need to be aware of that power and hierarchy. Try to lessen that, make everybody equal. Got to remember to be nice to each other, be safe psychologically, and be inclusive. And with that, I do have lots of references, and I have to end with a gator <laughs> from UF, and thank you. Any questions for Dr. Blue? So I have one to start, I guess. Um, there are a number of basic scientists who have uh, stayed through your presentation. Um, is there a message in terms of their possible involvement in beyond teaching case-based collaborative learning sessions and PBLs and lectures uh, in terms of what you've seen nationally or at the University of Florida? So if I'm understanding you right, sort of the role of the basic scientist in all of this, and you have a very important role. 
Uh, I think of it as a role to educate the other health professions as to how science, the science that you're working on, then develops into the treatments and the patient care recommendations. And for your learners, having them understand how that basic science that they're working on is then used for patient care and how healthcare providers work is incredibly important. And going back to my message around the diversity and inclusion, you're going to be thinking of things in a very different way. And that's great because those unrelated concepts coming together can then spark innovation. That's the whole push now. I know I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a researcher, a biomedical researcher, but I know within NIH that's the push around um, translational science. That's the push around team science. And yes, please, we need you to have you be involved in this. So I, I hope, and I don't know if anybody has questions or comments. You have a lot of skill sets, even just you know being more having the health professions understand how research is conducted better is incredibly important because that that's they're taking the work that you do and you know creating treatments or understanding diagnoses better. Mm -hmm. Amy, thanks so much. Um, you started out with uh, uh, this conclusion in 2014 that there was no evidence followed by a very hopeful statement that there are a lot of uh, studies going on. What should we be anticipating as these studies get completed and rolling out um, where the where the data in the future will come that will demonstrate differences? I think it's going to come from the things that people are doing and again some of the work that you're doing right now and it gets messy on both the education and the clinical front but I think as people can be more mindful of the types of studies and the research things that they're doing to set them up to be more rigorous that's the first thing that the field needs to do. So w w are, what, what's the nature of those studies? Will they Are they randomized clinical trials? Are they cohorts studies? Are they? I think they could be both. And again, this is an area where some of you will be even smarter at coming up with these things than I, I am. I'm trying to think some of your work around your education team steps training. I know I'm putting you on the spot, Steve, but. So I, I, I think there's a lot of I got it, Steve. Here. You got it. I don't know. My response is probably going to be uh, microphone worthy, but, um, but there are, I think, again, the clinical, uh, a true kind of highly controlled clinical trial is probably not as realistic because of clinical right. care. It's hard to do that. As a lot of the studies that you see, even with the diabetes study, is they probably don't have a control cohort. Right. You know? And so it's the nature of clinical practice. So I think we have to look at what are we doing during our educational processes that can translate to post graduation competency and then assessing those outcomes beyond graduation, which is something we've started to do here. And I think looking at focus groups, doing qualitative assessment in addition to some of the quantitative pieces related to clinical outcomes, I think is going to be really key. That's just my perspective, but there are a lot of ways to do that. It's how you cut the pie. And I think anyone across the nation is trying to figure out how do we do that well. It's a big question mark for a lot of us. But some of the studies that you mentioned, Amy, I think are moving that direction, which is really good. And, and some of these take time. And I didn't put up the slide from the BMJ. Oh, did it come out in 2016? It was a BMJ that showed that our rate of medical errors has not right. decreased in this country. Now, again, that could be because we're more sensitive and reporting better. But I am going to go back to we need to be doing this because when you do those root cause analyses around why things went wrong in patient care, most of the time it's that lack of interprofessional communication, mm -hmm. that lack of teamwork. Yeah. I don't know if there's another question or comment. Going once. Oh, here. Here you go. Yes, I just wondered, uh, so that frequently there's a lot of emphasis on the interprofessional education, uh, and we maybe even put that in the preclinical years, but then it's not reinforced in the clinical years, and it seems like that has the potential to actually undermine that message. Could you comment a little bit on, is that a, a concern? Uh, how do we actually make some of the interprofessional practice that's going on in those clinical years more salient for our learners so they actually see where it's actually occurring or how it's more relevant to their practice? Or, 
Yeah, no, it's a great question. It is a great issue. And again, I think the work that you all are doing in terms of preceptor training begins to address that. Um, back at UF, I started working with our quality and safety office around um, team steps training for the providers within the UF healthcare system. I was very upfront when I would come in. I'm, I'm, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a provider. I'm working with students. And I said, my, my rationale for being here is because I know when our students then move from the pre clinical into the clinical environments, I want them to see effective teamwork going on. And if you all are engaged in effective teamwork, then that just reinforces what we've been trying to teach for them. So again, that it is that I don't know, chicken and the egg is quite the thing, but we, we do need our practice. And again, thank you for attending the summit and all of the work that you all are doing because you are creating those practice environments. When the students come into them, they're not like, oh, this is just theoretical. I am actually seeing this in practice, and we just need more of that to be occurring. I don't know if anybody wants to comment, but I know Here. question over there. A uh, comment and a question. There are actually several opportunities going on in the third year already, family medicine clerkship, and then there's another interprofessional activity that's outside of the clerkships that all third year students are participating in. Uh, my question, and I asked Amy this this morning, is unlike the other uh, health professions, our students go to residencies before they enter practice. So there could be a gap based on what happens in medical school training, then they go to residency, then out into practice. So where is the interprofessional education focus on the residencies? For our students, especially as they're doing that before they enter practice. And I think that's a great question. My own work, particularly at UF, we have not broadened, gotten too much into the residency, but again, looking in that clinical environment review report, uh, and so those of you who probably work in ACGME, it's there, and I think those of us in this field are going to have to begin to push our colleagues in residency education more for things to be further reinforced so that what we teach our learners, again, doesn't get lost in residency and beyond. So yes, thank you. This is a big, tremendous culture shift for our, high, you know, for our healthcare system, and I am hopeful. <laughs> things are improving, and it's really because of the efforts of you, your colleagues, and your students, our students. Oh, well. Hey! <laughs> nice job, Bob. <laughs> So with regards to the, we are training our students up, and I think there's one thing that we can do better, and that is training our students to be positive agents of change for when they enter the workforce. And so that's something, um, at least in the School of Health Professions, we started to dialogue about that. What does that look like to have a curriculum to really effectively equip students to be positive agents of change? Because we can't retrofit the entire workforce. We can make inroads on occasion, like, like the work that Sarah is doing with learning and practice. But I think that's something that collectively we need to start considering more. How do we really effectively train students to be those positive agents of change. Right. Give them the skills they need to do that effectively because we can't tackle it by ourselves. And I think I find our learners coming in, they, they get this. It's, you know, for them to work in a team and work in a group and kind of be working together isn't necessarily something novel to them. Now, I would say they may not have the team skills that they think they have for working in clinical practice, which is why we need to be thinking about team training. And in our own work at UF, even be very explicit about team training, about the need for respect and flexibility and adaptability, et cetera. But again, and then having them think about how they can be positive agents for change. Taking that with me. Thank you again for being here, and we hope that uh, some people will be able to stay for the Ed Light.